Um, thank you all for coming. Um, it's a pleasure being here. Uh, as Adam mentioned, this is the second time that we have run this Student Criminology Forum and it's certainly my pleasure uh, to be here talking again for the second time uh, to students who are studying in areas related to criminology uh, and who might find what we do here at the AIC to be interesting and worthwhile work. And I do hope that over today, much like Adam has said, that you find what we have to present to you interesting and inspiring uh, in terms of the work that you're currently doing at the universities or in, in, in your full-time or part-time jobs. I started this presentation last year much to the uh, laughter of my colleagues about an anecdote about my grandmother. Um, and the reason why, you might think that's a bit weird, but the reason being is because uh, every time I said to my grandmother I was working at the Australian Institute of Criminology, be guaranteed her first question was, so do you see dead bodies? And of course, <laughs> it was kind of interesting because I've never seen a dead body in my life, but nevertheless, it was the first question my grandmother ever asked. And then she thought I was a CSI agent. And then she thought, you know, if somehow I was involved in the police and I was out investigating crimes. And the reality was, None of that was true. And the one thing that I've learnt in the 10 years, as Adam said, is uh, being here at the AIC from research intern, uh, a four week internship right through to research manager, the one thing I've learnt, if anything else in this organisation, is how to explain to someone that I don't work as a CSI agent and that I actually work for the government in research. And while I get to do very, very, very interesting work, it's not exactly the same as what everyone pitches criminology and I think many of you probably have had very much a similar experience going to parties and otherwise and having to explain to friends and family just exactly what it is you do on a day-to-day -day basis. <laughs> I'm fortunate <clears throat> because as the manager of the Violent and Serious Crime Monitoring Program, I believe at least, although I think my colleagues would probably disagree, that I have one of the most interesting things to do with the AIC. Um, looking at those types of crimes and those types of issues which have been around for hundreds of years, um, but ultimately which drives significant policy development, both at a Commonwealth and at a jurisdictional level. My phone is ringing, excuse me. Um, and so <clears throat> it's with great pleasure that I can talk to you today about some of the work that myself and my team do in the area of drug use and violence to give you just a bit of a taste of what happens here at the AIC uh, in terms of the work that we do. Uh, and I guess to, as I said, to inspire you to think about how research actually happens, not only at an academic level, which is of course, where all you have come from, uh, but also how at a government level, research gets designed, developed and implemented in order to achieve key outcomes, both for government and for the academic community. Um, as Adam said, I'm the manager of the Violent Serious Crime Monitoring Program, and that incorporates not just drugs and homicide, though that's going to be the, the bulk of my presentation today. Uh, we do a range of other studies focusing on a whole number of different areas. For example, Adam mentioned earlier uh, the domestic violence uh, perpetrators Profiling Project. Uh, we're currently looking at uh, issues in relation to policing uh, Indigenous uh, in metropolitan Indigenous people and their drug use in metropolitan and um, and uh, non-rural or remote areas. Uh, we've also done a whole raft of of different research on other violent related topics, including uh, assaults, alcohol assaults, um, and a whole range of other things. So uh, the team is diverse. But what I'm going to do is talk to you today about two projects that we run, and those two projects one might say um, are flagships for the AIC insofar as they are some of our longest running research projects that we've been running here at the AIC. Um, but also more importantly, they are two examples of where the AIC actually currently undertakes real research insofar as it is research where we have designed the actual methodology. We undertake for the most part the data collection for those projects and we do the analysis and provide that information back to our stakeholders through to government and hopefully to disseminate it into the academic community. Um, in terms of <coughs> drugs and drug related research, the Institute has an interesting history uh, dating back over many years um, and here I've just got a list of the various different projects that we run or have run over the last 10 years or so uh, in relation to uh, drugs and crime, looking into the issue around illicit drug use and its relationship to crime. Um, our flagship project, the one that I'll be going into detail today of course is first listed there is our Drug Use Monitoring in Australia program and I would like to acknowledge in fact that we actually have some people here from Edith Cowan University today who actually assist the AIC as contractors to collect this data over in Perth so I would like to welcome them here today as well as some of their uh, researchers from the actual School of Criminology over there. Uh, the Drug Use Careers of Offender Study was a study of prisoners uh, in 2001 through to 2005 where we actually got down and interviewed more than 2,000 prisoners across Australia about their history and experiences of drug use and the relationship between that drug use and their actual offending. 
I myself, a couple of years ago, were involved in the evaluation of the drug courts in Queensland. And in fact, Adam, who just gave you a presentation about the Murray Court evaluation, um, the drug court evaluation was very similar insofar it was based on a very similar methodology, looking to see whether or not putting people through intensive drug rehabilitation as a result of, uh, of a court-mandated program, whether in fact that has any tangible outcomes in reducing their offending and indeed reducing their contact with the criminal justice system and imprisonment. Uh, some other members of the team have done some performance measurement framework development for, the drug, for drug law enforcement. Uh, we've been involved in evaluating the Police Drug Diversion Program, which is a national program, runs in every state and territory, albeit through a slightly different, differently designed program at a jurisdictional level, uh, but nevertheless is a national program where police divert first-time drug users out of the criminal justice system uh, and into brief interventions or, or, or giving them education or information related pamphlets. And finally, as I mentioned, Indigenous substance abuse and policing related projects. That's by no means an exhaustive list of what we cover at the ARC in terms of our drugs research, but nevertheless represents some of the key things that for those of you who might be working at the university in your studies or otherwise on, on drug, and, uh, drug or alcohol related offending might certainly be interested in having a look at some of that research, which of course is available on the AIC's website. Um, the Drug Use Monitoring in Australia program, uh, as I said, is going to be the one that I'll talk to you today about mostly. Um, it is as I said, the AIC's flagship research project. It's been running for 13 and a half years. It's one of the longest running continuous projects that the AIC has ever run. Um, and what in effect it is, it's a project whereby every three months, the AIC, in collaboration with data collectors that we have in all of the Australian states and territories with the exception of Tasmania and the ACT, sit down with criminal offenders who have been detained by the police and we fill out, well I don't of course, but of course our wonderful colleagues in the various different jurisdictions fill out what's otherwise a comprehensive 15 to 16 page survey that covers things right through from their demographic information around whether they're married, whether, they've, uh, whether they're currently employed, what their indigenous status is, to uh, what type of drugs they had used in the last 12 months, whether they'd been a drug user in the last 30 days, whether in fact they'd used any drugs in the last 48 hours. And then if they had, and whether they'd purchased any drugs I should say, if they had done that, we asked them a whole raft of questions about how they accessed drugs, who they got them from, not in terms of names, but just in terms of general, whether they were a friend or, or, or a relative or otherwise. Um, how they access the drugs, how much they paid for them, how much they actually obtain, and of course, as I mentioned, how much they use. The second component to this very comprehensive survey is that at the end of the survey, we actually ask the police detainees to voluntarily provide us with a urine sample. Now, for many people, certainly in, in criminal, criminological research or social sciences research, that seems a little bizarre and odd. How can you be in a police station and ask for a urine sample from a police detainee for the purposes of the research? And, and the, the answer to that question is not without some difficulty, but far better than we had ever expected when the project first started. Um, back in 1999, when this project first started, and when the methodology was first introduced, this notion that you could interview police detainees in police watch houses whilst they were being detained by the police and ask them to provide a urine sample for the purposes of urinalysis testing, I guess the scepticism at the time was that there is no way in hell these people are going to provide you with a urine sample given the situation and circumstances that they're in. The reality is more than 70% of them do. Um, they're more than willing to provide a urine sample and by and large that has to do with the wonderful work that our data collectors and interviewers do at each of the locations in developing a rapport with these people. Um, but the urine sample comes with a guarantee of anonymity. There's nothing that can connect that urine sample back to the individual in any way. Uh, there is no way that information can be used by the police once it has been collected for the purposes of anything in relation to their matter. Uh, so all of the assurances that we have given over the last 13 years and six months, which have, have, have never caused any grief in that sense, are one of the key reasons how this project seems to maintain a much higher than expected or much higher than originally anticipated compliance when it comes to the provision of urinalysis.